What's up, music nerds? Today is the day that I read Herman Helmholtz on the sensations of tone. Or at least the first chapter of it. I'm going to take you through the chapter, and we're going to mess around with some of the sounds as we read on sensationsoftone.com. Now, I'm a lover of music and someone who's interested in music theory, but I'm by no means a physicist, and so I have been a little bit concerned that a lot of this is going to go over my head, but I was just reading through the introduction, and I found this. In order to facilitate the use of the book by readers who have no special knowledge of physics and mathematics, I have transferred to appendices at the end of the book all special instructions for performing the more complicated experiments and also all mathematical investigations. These appendices are therefore especially intended for the physicist and contain the proofs of my assertions. So, if you're like me, then don't worry. Helmholtz intended this book for you too, so let's get going. Chapter 1, On the Sensation of Sound in General. He starts by defining the difference between noises and musical tones. A noise is a rapid alternation of different kinds of sensations of sound. Think, for example, of the rattling of a carriage over granite paving stones, the splashing or seething of a waterfall, etc. On the other hand, a musical tone strikes the ear as a perfectly undisturbed, uniform sound. A musical tone is a simple, regular kind of sensation, whereas in a noise, many various sensations of musical tone are irregularly mixed up. You can actually see this pretty easily if you look at the waveforms of different sounds. I'm going to show you the waveform of a noise and the waveform of a musical tone. We can easily compound noises out of musical tones, as, for example, by simultaneously striking all the keys contained in one or two octaves of a pianoforte. And with this app, we can actually do that. Not on a pianoforte, but on my MIDI keyboard. Let's start with middle C. And add E. Ooh. Ooh. Okay, that's definitely noise. Ooh. Ah. Doesn't take very many presses of the key to become noise. So he goes on to describe how the ear picks up atmospheric vibrations, and comes to the conclusion that the sensation of a musical tone is due to a rapid periodic motion of the sonorous body, the sensation of a noise to non-periodic motion. That's exactly what we saw in the waveforms. Having thus spoken of the principal division of sound into noise and musical tones, we pass on to the peculiarities which distinguish such tones one from the other. We are acquainted with three points of difference in musical tones. I'm gonna guess pitch, volume, and timbre, maybe? Their force, that's volume, their pitch, and their quality. Boom. Firstly, we recognize that the force of a musical tone increases and diminishes with the extent or so-called amplitude of the oscillations. When we strike a string, its vibrations are at first sufficiently large for us to see them, and its corresponding tone is loudest. The visible vibrations become smaller and smaller, and at the same time the loudness diminishes. The same conclusion results from the diminution of the loudness of a tone when we increase our distance from the sounding body in the open air. The pitch and quality remain unaltered, for it is only the amplitude of the oscillations of the particles of air which diminishes as their distance from the sounding body increases. Hence, loudness must depend on its amplitude. The second essential difference between musical tone consists in their pitch. Pitch depends solely on the length of time in which each single vibration is executed, or, which comes to the same thing, on the number of vibrations completed in a given time. We're accustomed to taking a second as the unit of time and shall consequently mean by the pitch number or frequency of a tone the number of vibrations which the particles of a sounding body perform in one second of time. I wonder why he doesn't say hertz. The pitch number of a note is commonly called the pitch of the note. I'm going to do a quick Wikipedia search. Huh. 
Hertz wasn't even born yet. He wasn't born until 1857. And they didn't start using the term until 1935, so I'm way off. So Helmholtz just calls it the pitch number, or the frequency. This is the figure for his siren. A thin disc of cardboard or tin plate which can be set in rapid motion about its axis by means of a string which passes over a larger wheel. On the margin of the disc, there is punched a set of holes at equal intervals. Of these, there are 12 in the figure. One or more similar series of holes at equal distances are introduced on concentric circles. There is one such of eight in the figure. C is a pipe which is directed over one of the holes. If the disc is made to revolve 10 times in one second, the outer circle will produce 120 puffs in one second, giving the resulting note a pitch number of 120. Now don't worry, you don't have to go and make this out of cardboard at home, because we have a virtual version right here. Let's set it up exactly the way he says. Speed 10, 12 holes in row 1, 8 in row 2. Let's speed it up. Add a hole. Ooh. And a nice octave there. It results immediately from experiments with the siren that two series of the same number of holes revolving with the same velocity give musical tones the same pitch, quite independently of the size and form of the holes or of the pipe. We even obtain a musical tone of the same pitch if we allow a metal point to strike in the holes as they revolve instead of blowing. Hence, it follows firstly that the pitch of a tone depends only on the number of puffs or swings and not on their form, force, or method of production. Further, it's very easily seen that increasing the velocity of rotation and consequently the number of puffs produced in a second, makes the pitch higher or sharper. He goes on to experiment with intervals using the siren, so let's do that. A musical tone which is an octave higher than another makes exactly twice as many vibrations in a given time as the latter. That was true with 16 and 8. Let's try 7 and 14. three is a fifth, three to four is a fourth, so let's try nine and twelve. Perfect. What else do we have? Four to five is a major third, and five to six is a minor third. I want to start with eight holes in unison. If we move this up to ten, that's our major third, and up to twelve is our perfect fifth. Now if we move this up to ten, that should be our minor third. Uh, to get our fourth we need 12 and 16. There we go. And this one back down to 8. gives us our octave. In the next part of the chapter, Helmholtz uses those ratios to calculate the rest of the notes in a C major scale.
Then he uses the convention of A at 440 vibrations in a second to calculate the pitch numbers of all the notes in a C major scale. And if we click on them, we can hear them at all one, two, three, four, five, six, seven octaves. Let's hear an A. Now I know that there is much heated debate about concert pitch. It seems like 440 was pretty recently adopted when this was written. Oh, the Paris Academy has lately fixed the pitch number of the same note at 435. If you want to read more about that, you can read his abstract of history of musical pitch in Appendix 20, Section 8. But let's get back to the chapter. We finally get to the third aspect of musical tone, which is the quality of tone. When we hear notes of the same force and the same pitch sounded successively on a pianoforte, a violin, clarinet, oboe, or trumpet, or by the human voice, the character of the musical tone of each of these instruments is so different that by means of it we recognize with the greatest ease which of these instruments was used. In inquiring to what external physical difference in the waves of sound the different qualities of tone correspond, we must remember that the amplitudes of the vibration determines the force or loudness, and the period of the vibration the pitch. Quality of tone can therefore depend on neither of these. The only possible hypothesis, therefore, is that the quality of tone should depend upon the manner in which the motion is performed within the period of each single vibration. Now, I have a handy-dandy piece of software that can show me the waveforms of different sounds, but this is how Helmholtz did it. He has a tuning fork with just like a pencil attached to the end of it, and then he just tugs the paper underneath it. Here's a little animation of what that would look like, although probably a lot faster than that. Then he gives us the figure drawings for two different shaped curves. The first one is imagining a hammer raised by a water wheel, and the second, a bouncing ball. Here's the motion of the water wheel. We can play the animation and see how that oh, curve is drawn. There's the drop. And if I get my MIDI keyboard back out, we can see what this function sounds like. This is supposed to most closely resemble the curve of a violin. I can hear how that sounds like a synthesized violin. Let's take a look at the bouncing ball. There's the animation. Let's see how it sounds. That sounds a little more brassy, maybe like a horn. Okay, now this is a really cool app. You get to sketch the shape of a function and then hear how it sounds. Let's try something simple to begin with. something more dramatic. Ooh. What if we had starts low, tapers off, goes high. Whoa. One more. Okay, just one, one more. What if we have a little heartbeat? Okay, that's fun, but we gotta move on. The last thing he talks about in this chapter are upper harmonic tones. Now you can play the first few of these on a guitar pretty easily. When you put your finger 
lightly halfway up the string and play it, that's your first harmonic. He has calculated the first 16 harmonics. And if we click on this, we can hear them. that we're ever actually hearing the 14th, 15th, 16th harmonic. I mean, they've got to be so faint. G.S. Ohm was the first to declare that there is only one form of vibration which will give rise to no harmonic upper partial tones, and which will therefore consist solely of the prime tone. This is the form of vibration which we have described above as peculiar to the pendulum and the tuning forks. That's why they have such a nice, pure, clean tone. Now, since quality of tone, as we have seen, depends on the form of vibration, which also determines the occurrence of upper partial tones, we have to inquire how far differences in quality of tone depend on different force or loudness of upper partials. This inquiry will be found to give a means of clearing up our concepts of what has hitherto been a perfect enigma, the nature of quality of tone, which we will get into in chapter two. If there was anything in chapter one that you wanted to read in more detail, or if you wanted to go mess around with that draw a function app, go to sensationsoftone.com and I'll be here next week with chapter two. So make sure you're subscribed. See ya.